out of order. We've all seen the signs on vending machines, on Coke machines, on the ice cream machine at McDonald's when you're craving that M&M McFlurry, out of order. It means that it's not working or it's not working properly. When Paul looked at this church at Thessalonica, he saw many positive things, many good things. They were growing in their faith and they were showing their love and they were increasing in patience and they had a, an amazing testimony uh, that was spreading throughout the region. And Paul commended them for this and he congratulated them on this and he praised them and he thanked God for them and for these things. There were some things though when Paul looked, and we all have room for improvement, when he looked at this church that were out of order. That means they weren't working. And he means that in the very literal sense. Turn with me this morning to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And while you turn there, I've titled the message this morning, Out of Order. Out of Order. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 6. And I'll read down in, through verse number 12 in your hearing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse number 6. You follow along there in your Bible as I read aloud in your hearing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. This is the word of God. Paul says these words. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this privilege to study the Word of God, to hear from it, and to have practical application made to our daily lives. Lord, I thank you that spiritual truths have practical application. And I pray, Lord, that as we preach this message, as we hear this message preached, as the Holy Spirit teaches us and preaches to us individually and takes the seed of the Word of God and plants it deep into our hearts, that it would bring forth fruit unto life everlasting, those things that are pleasing in your sight that we would take another step of advancement in our faith, in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be fed, that we would be nourished, that we would be filled with all that you have for us. And then, Lord, that we would go on with God in a, in a way that is very pleasing to you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his shed blood. Thank you for acceptance through him and the forgiveness of sins. We bless your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. Paul had left off in verse number five, and we didn't read it, but we got it last week, talking about the return of the Lord. Uh, as is his custom throughout these two epistles, he often and repeatedly refers to the coming again of Jesus Christ. And each time he does, and this is so important, church, he includes in the context of Christ's return various practical applications to living the Christian life. He links the future return of Jesus Christ to our present everyday lives as Christians and as God's people. He says in verse number five of our text, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and <clears throat> into the patient waiting for Christ. The picture that Paul paints of the return of Christ led many of these Thessalonian Christians to believe that the Lord would come back in their lifetime. And more than that, that he would come back sooner rather than later. This had resulted in some making the decision to sort of withdraw themselves from the normal duties of life, to neglect the normal responsibilities of everyday life. And because of this, things in this church were out of order. 
And in response to this, Paul begins this section with a command. He begins this section with a command. Look at it with me in verse number six. He says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Before we really get into the command, I want to take just a moment to paint a picture of what the subject is here. And we talked about it being out of order, meaning that things weren't working. And so the subject here is work. And Paul is addressing things that really aren't working well within this church or individuals who aren't working. In verse 6, we see the word disorderly. In verse 7, again, disorderly. In verse 10, the phrase would not work. And in verse 11, we see the word disorderly again and the phrase working not at all. And so clearly, Paul is talking about things being out of order and things not working. Not working at all or not working properly, not properly functioning within this church. And that's what he's dealing with. Here in this command, he begins with this command in verse number 6. We see the seriousness of it or the severity of it. He says this, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The invocation of the name of Jesus Christ demonstrates that this is a biblical mandate. Paul is not merely sharing his own perspective or his own opinion on the subject. This was a command from God. And so we see the seriousness of it. And then also we see the, specific, the specificity of this command. He says this, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Notice first that this command is specifically directed to the church corporately. There is a way that, well, let me back up and say this. When a church is right, when we are serving God, we are to function as one. We are a body, Candlestick Baptist Church. We are a church. We are a congregation. We are an assembly of believers. We are a body in Christ, and when we are together, and when we are doing what God wants us to do, we are to function as one. We are to uh, be in unity and be unified. And Paul directs this command to the church corporately. Uh, that is the congregation. And there's a way that we are to handle things. He says, now we command you, brethren, that ye withdraw yourselves. The plural is used, brethren, ye and yourselves, indicating that Paul is addressing the entire church. He's addressing the body. He's addressing the assembly uh, there in Thessalonica. When there is unity in the church, the congregation functions as a body. When a church is spiritual, there is order and there is united adherence to the word of God and really to the leading of the spirit of God. This command is specifically directed to the church corporately. Then, too, we see that this command is specifically dealing with Christians individually. So important. He says this, that ye would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Notice the use of the phrase every brother and the pronoun he. Did you notice that the singular is used? The singular is used. This is important for many reasons, among which is the idea that we are to deal with situations that arise on a Christian by Christian basis and on a case by case basis. And in our text, the individual Christians that are being singled out are those who are first disorderly. And we said that it means out of order. It means not working or not working properly. And he says that we are to corporately withdraw ourselves from the individual Christian that is out of order. Paul's instruction is to withdraw from them. They are being disorderly. And then secondly, those who are disobedient. And the two really go hand in hand. He says, and not after the tradition which he received of us. The tradition he's talking about is described as that which Paul says he received of us or was received of us. He's talking about uh, 
first, he's not talking about family traditions, and he's not talking about cultural traditions. He's talking about the divine instructions and teaching he had communicated uh, to them, both in writing in the first epistle, and then also when he was with them, the things that he taught them and told them that he makes reference to many, many times. They knew from what, they'd, from what he had already said that what they were supposed to be doing and yet some were being disobedient. They weren't doing what Paul had said to do, both orally and in writing. They just weren't doing it. This command then teaches us the responsible way to respond to those who are behaving irresponsibly. How do we deal with brethren who are disorderly? Paul says withdraw from them. Corporately withdraw from them. And there's a reason for that. There's a, a big reason from, for that. And so that's the command. He begins this section with a command. Then he continues with a clarification. He continues with a clarification. He says in verses 7 through 9, look at it there in your text. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. He clarifies here that this command is regarding work. As Paul begins to offer clarification, he gives them an example to follow. And in so doing, we see who the example is. He says in verse number 6, look at it again, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. And then in verse 9 he says, Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Notice in both of these verses he uses the, the phrase, Follow us. Follow us. And then in verse 9 he says we are an ensample or an example. Clearly then Paul and Timothy and Silas are the examples that the Christians in this church were to follow and that Christians in general are to follow. Then too we see not only who the example is, we see what the example is. What is the example that Paul and Timothy and Silas set for these Thessalonian Christians while they were with them? He says it in verse number 8. Look at it with me. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. The example is one first of not freeloading, not expecting someone else to take care of us. Uh, he says, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. That means if we ate it, we either worked for it or we paid for it. We did not expect a handout. We did not freeload. We did not act as though others owed us something or society owed us something. Then, too, it's an example of working. He says, They wrought with labor and travail night and day. You've got to imagine that Paul's plate was full, preaching in the synagogues every Sabbath day, going into the open marketplace, and preaching and teaching and gathering and church planting and forming and congregating and all of these different things besides his own personal study and his own personal reading uh, and his preparation and, all, and spiritual walk and all of these different things. And then in addition to that, he had physical needs just like you and I do. He had to buy clothes. He had to buy food. He had to have the basic, at least, necessities of life. And what did he do? How did he fit it all in? Well, he labored and travailed. That means he really, really applied himself. And then it says he did it night and day. And it was necessary. And then thirdly, the, he set an example not only of not freeloading and an example of working, but he, he set an example of not being burdensome. Not being burdensome. He goes on to say that they did this that we, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. And the word chargeable means to be burdensome or to be indebted to or owing to. Uh, anytime a member of a church doesn't pull his own weight, if he doesn't do his part within the body, 
then he becomes a burden to the rest of the body. And Paul is clarifying here what he's talking about. He's talking about work. He's talking about jo a job <laughs> and working and travailing and doing it night and day. A command, a clarification. Next we see here in our text a consequence. A consequence. He says in verses 10 and 11, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now he's already clarified that this has to do with work, and it has to do with hard work. And now he adds a consequence to this clarification. He says that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Rewards help us help to encourage us to do right. And consequences help to discourage us from doing wrong. And there, there should be, and it's a good thing, if there's a reward for doing right, and then a consequence, and I'll use that word because it's the important word, for doing wrong. And by the way, these are natural consequences he's talking about here. They are normal consequences. I point that out because there are certain consequences that God has built into the natural order of things. There is an order. The Bible teaches us that God does all things decently and what? In order. In order. Not out of order, but in order. So if God does everything in order, that means that he has created or made or designed an order for things. And if we go against that order, then we are out of order. That means we're not working in conjunction with the natural order of things. We are disorderly, is the word that Paul uses repeatedly here in our text. Not working at all or uh, would not work. And so that's what was happening here. And God has built it in so that there are consequences. It's important to note that, and I point that out, because there's no vengeance here in the text. There's no vindictiveness, if you will. I don't use the word punishment. I use the word consequence, and I do that intentionally. If I don't work, I don't get paid. And if I don't get paid, I can't buy food. And if I can't buy food, I can't eat. Let me be very clear. God always had a system uh, in place for those who can't work or for those who can't find work. Uh, God always had a system built in. And you may recall it from way back in the, in the Levitical, you know, Mosaic times and the Levitical law. He had it where you had landowners and not everybody was a landowner. But you had landowners and you had people of wealth and you had people that had stuff. And then you had those that, that ha didn't have. For whatever reason, life happened to them. Remember Naomi and her, her husband died, her three sons died, her and Ruth, they went back. Boaz was a wealthy man, he was a godly man, he was a wealthy man. Here was a woman who feared God, and two women really, uh, Naomi and Ruth. And, but they had nothing. Life had happened to them. And it wasn't necessarily anything that they had done specifically or in particular that caused them to not have anything. But God had made provision for people like that. God has made provision for people that life just happens to and the unexpected happens and, and the unthinkable happens and you find yourself in a position. And he had a built-in biblical welfare system. And you'll remember that Naomi sent Ruth out to find a field and, and her, her, she lighted on the field of Boaz, remember that? And so there she was and the way that, that God had set it up in the Old Testament was that when they reaped their fields, they went through. And they didn't cut the corners. Remember, they, they made their turn like that, so the corners were left. And then they could only you know, reap it one time, and they got all of the harvest in. But there were always things left behind. And they weren't to go back a second time or a third time and re-glean and get all of that stuff. That was for the poor of the land. Now, how did they get it? Did they go out and check their mailbox and there was the harvest in their mailbox? No. They had to go to those fields that were owned by other people and work. They had to glean the corners and pick up the part that was left behind. 
uh, from, the, from the reapers. But God had designed it that way so that the poor of the land and those that life had happened to and those that were down for whatever reason and who were trying to get back on their feet so that they wouldn't go hungry. No one had to go hungry. And then there's the system it's built in even deeper because you say, well, what about those that are disabled mentally or physically? What about those that are sick? What about those that are unable to work? You mean like Naomi? Now, we don't know all the details. We know that she was uh, elderly. And for whatever reason, she wasn't going out. But she sent Ruth out. And Ruth always got enough for herself. And she brought home for Naomi. And so the family was to take up the slack. The family, even though Ruth was not a woman of means, it, was still, it still fell to her to take care of her mother-in-law. And so she went out and she gleaned and she worked and she did what she could to provide for herself and for her mother. And that's really the way that God had designed it under the, the Levitical law. And so God always makes a way. And he always makes a way to provide for those who either can't work or those who can't find work. And there was a way to do that. But that's not what he's talking about here in our text. Pay close attention to the wording. He says, If any would not work, neither should he eat. The phrase would not work clearly points then to an unwillingness to work. Not an inability, but an unwillingness. Would not. It means he will not or he is unwilling is the way we say that and the Bible says if a man is not willing to work then he shouldn't eat for the average person I suspect it wouldn't be long and our stomachs would begin to encourage us to go find a job to find some way to feed it <laughs> and and that's a good thing God made man to work let me say that again God made man to work. That, that's part of the original creation. It's built into us, and it's built into us by God. Turn with me all the way back. Hold your place here in 2 Thessalonians to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to go all the way back to the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter number 2 in your Bible. And I'm going to read to you first verse number 8. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 8. Here's what the Bible says. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, I just want to take just a moment to point this out. What does it say? Up until this point, we see that God is creating. God is speaking. God is saying, let there be, let there be, let us make man after our image, and so on and so forth. And then here, it changes verbs. Did you notice that? It goes from, a work, from an act of creation that where something is made out of nothing via the voice of God, the word of God, to saying that, the Lord God, in verse number 8, and the Lord God, notice what he did, planted a garden. Now think what you want, but planting to me implies work. In fact, if you've ever had to plant anything, you had to get the ground ready. If there was a ground covering, you had to remove the ground covering, i.e. the grass or the weeds or whatever there was there. And then you had to break up the ground. You're already starting to sweat thinking about it. And then you had to get some, something to plant, whether they were plants that were already formed or whether it was in seed form and plant the seeds or the plants. And then you have to put the ground back and then maybe you have to come, uh, come in with some fertilizer or some soil and then you have to water them and then you have to keep the wheat and all the different things. All I'm saying is this. It says that the Lord God planted. He's already setting an, an example for us of work. And so it says that, and then go down to verse number 15. It says this, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden, notice, to dress it and to keep it. 
Now before we get into the meaning of the word dress and we're going to deal with that, I want us to note the chronology here. Sin has not yet entered into the world. The fall has not yet happened. That doesn't happen until chapter 3. And so work, contrary to what some people believe and teach, is not part of the curse. It was part of God's original design. Before sin entered into the world, before Eve was deceived and took of the fruit, ate, gave to her husband with her, and he did eat, the eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked. They hid themselves amongst the trees from the voice of the Lord. Before, they, before sin entered into the world, God gave man a job to do. God gave man a... Uh, uh, he gave him work to do. That's the order of things. That's the natural order of things. And then it says that he put the man in the garden to dress it and to keep it. The word dress is a very rich and interesting word, and it teaches us something about work that we all need to be aware of as God's people. Dress. <laughs> it's translated nine times in our Bible as till, T-I-L-L, -L, till the ground, right? Like a farmer. Uh, it's translated five times as work, and it's translated two times as labor. And so clearly, God made man to work originally, before sin entered into the world. Now, after sin, and we won't really talk about this in this message, but after, after it, he said, By the sweat of thy face shalt thou work, labor. And, and so there was an element added to it. But it wasn't work that was part of the curse. It was the ramifications of it, the conditions in which he would have to work. Uh, it would obviously become less pleasurable and more toilsome and burdensome. But God made man to work. That's part of the original creation. Nine times till, five times work, two times labor. And so clearly God made man to work. But there's more. The word dress is also translated 227 times, more than all of the other times combined, it's translated as serve. Wow, serve. That means, to, that means more than anything else, for the Christian to work is a form of service to God. Somebody said, how can I serve God? Hey, go to work, do a good job, maintain a Christian testimony on the job. Be on time, every time. Be early. Do the best you can. Do everything that's required and expected of you and do more. And do it with a smile on your face. Do it with joy in your heart. Do it as unto the Lord and not as unto men. Perform your job as though you are serving God because you are. You are. More than anything else, when we work as Christians, we are to be serving God. God. I think the, the record makes that clear. In the Levitical, uh, those, that word serve 227 times, many of, many of those times it's used in connection with the Levitical priesthood when they would perform their service to God, when they would serve the Lord. Worship is the idea. When they would perform the sacrifices and the service of the tabernacle and then later of the temple, that was the word serve that it's used there that God put Adam in the garden to dress it, to keep it. It means to serve God. It was an opportunity for Adam to use his physical body, which by the way was created by God, to serve God with. What was it that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20? What? Know ye not that your body, your physical body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and you're not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's or which belong to God. And so there is that spiritual service to God. Uh, the time will come when they shall worship God in spirit and in truth, for the Lord seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, right? And so Jesus talked about that, and there is that spiritual aspect. But we are physical creatures. We are physical beings. And who made us physical? God did. And what did God do when he made himself physical and took upon himself the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of men? What did he do? 
He served his father. He, was, he said, I wish you not that I must be about my father's business. He was always about the work of God, always about the business of God. And so how do we serve God? By working. We, get, we go to work. When Adam dressed the garden, he was, he was working. He was serving God while working. We were created by God to work. With this in mind, let's look again at what Paul says in verse number 11. He says, for we bear, uh, sorry, he says, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now, there's an apparent play on words here between the word work and the word busybody. There is, the Lord designed us to work. That is, he designed us to be busy. We call work business for a reason. And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. It means that he must be about the work of God or the work that God sent him to do. The Lord designed us to be busy, to work, to be busy. And the truth, and we all know this, is that if we're not busy about our own business, which for the Christian is to be our father's business, whatever other in business it may entail, then we are going to be busy in someone else's business. We're going to be busy bodies. That's what it means. God made our body to be busy. So if we're not busy about the things that God commands us to be busy and desires us and designed us to be busy about, then we're going to be busy about things that he did not design us to be busy about. That means that if we're not in order, we're going to be out of order or disorderly, right? Then lastly, we see for, here from our text a correction. And church, I love this. I love how God doesn't give up on his own. I love how he doesn't write us off when we get it wrong. Don't you thank God for that? Because we'd have been written off a long time ago. He says in verse number 12, look at it with me. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he commanding and exhorting by our Lord Jesus Christ? Them that are such. Such as what? Verse number 11. For here's what we hear. He said, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working, not at all. They're just not working. He said, now them that are such, them that aren't working, them that are disorderly. Remember he began this in the command, because this he uses the word command here again. But this is a different command than the first one, because the first command was directed to the church corporately. Remember we saw that? How we are to respond. We are to withdraw from such. It means that we are to be the antithesis of it, the opposite of it. We are to exemplify the true character of, of the Christian, which is the character of Christ, which is one that must be about our Father's business, busy doing what God has occupied us to do, uh, uh, what God has called us to do. Jesus said it this way, occupy till I come. Now he takes the time to address not the church corporately, but individuals, the individuals that are such. He says, now them that are such. Now let me talk to you guys. I told the church to withdraw from you, but let me talk to you now. Let, let's have a little one-on-one -on -one here. Let's have some personal time. Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. If you're disorderly, if you're out of order, if you're not working, if you're out of service, we invite you to come back. In fact, the Holy Spirit has moved us. He's, in, he's inspired us to invite you to come back to begin just to quietly work and to eat your own bread. That is to get back in order, to get back in service, to begin again to serve God. He doesn't wash his hands of us, church. He doesn't turn his back on us. He doesn't write us off. Instead, he calls us to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. He beckons us to the right. He puts yet another door of opportunity before us and invites us to walk through it. He says here in our text, to any who are walking disorderly, to any who are working not at all, to any who are busybodies, to turn from it and begin at once to quietly work and eat their own bread. Two things here and we're done. There was chaos in this church, disorder, because certain brethren weren't working. Instead, they were busy trying to straighten everybody else out. The solution, 
work with quietness. The word means calm. It means peace. It means rest. Following this precept would restore peace to the church and to, the, and to their lives as individual Christians. And lastly, he exhorts them to eat their own bread. Because they weren't working, they were eating bread that wasn't theirs. They were depending on others who were working to provide for them. Interesting how that works. For one re reason or another, I'm not going to work. But I expect you to work. Paul's answer, quit being a burden and start being a blessing. Go to work. Get in order. Get back in service. As we patiently wait for the Lord Jesus to return, we are to work. We are to view our work as a means of serving God. When we work, when we work hard, when we work in the right spirit, it is a form of service to God. Church, it is a form of worship to God. Candlestick is full of people who work. They are hard workers, so inspiring all the time. I mean people who have jobs where they still go to an employer, they still go to a job. I mean people who are retired, who work every bit as hard, and some of them even harder than they did when they were working for an employer. If I were cherry-picking messages, I wouldn't have chose this message. That's really the beauty of preaching through books of the Bible, is it forces us into places that we might not go otherwise. Do I think this message is needed? Did anybody come to mind? Yeah, boy, he needs to hear it, she needs it. No, no, not in candlestick, not at this time. Maybe there was a time when there were those, and no doubt, but not now. I wouldn't have chosen this message, but here we are nonetheless. The message then is this. While you are hard at work, remember that it's a form of service to God, that God designed it that way that he accepts it as a form of service, and he accepts it as a form of worship. This has the potential to revolutionize some, some people's lives. Because while we are hard workers here, it may be that sometimes work gets burdensome, and you just want to be off. You just want to get, put your time in and get out of there. And I get that. I've been there. I've been there. I won't tell you how recent, but I've been there. But if we would view it, Paul is telling them, hey, view it this way. It's a form of service to God. God designed work. It's his, uh, it's his idea. Before the curse, there was work. After the curse, there'll be work. Hey, we'll serve God for all of eternity. If we view work the proper way, the way God has designed it to be viewed, We'll be better employers. We'll have a richer testimony. And we'll actually be able to worship God at work and while we work because work is a form of worship to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of the various things you address in your precious word. Thank you that you do not turn your, backs on, your back on these who weren't working, who were disorderly, but you called them back and you said, come on back. You opened a door for them, said, come on back in and get back to work. Thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned this world, that when sin entered, you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay for that sin. And I thank you that all that come to you in faith are cleansed, are forgiven, and are eternally saved. I pray, O oh God, that if there be any out there today that are unsaved, that hear these words, that your Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts and draw them to Jesus Christ, that they would say, Yes, Lord, forgive me, O oh God. Save me for Jesus' sake. And Lord, we know that you'll do it. Thank you for the time in Jesus' name. God bless you, church, and I love you.